Good afternoon or evening, or depending on where you are. My name is Mark Evanier, and this is the fourth of these cartoon voices panels that I'm doing here. We're doing these online because there's no Comic Con to do them at this year. We couldn't do one at WonderCon. We can't do one at Comic Con, although there will be a Comic Con voice over cartoon voice panel that will be online the day that it ordinarily would be at Comic Con. And this time you can get a seat in the room. Uh, I have invited, as I always do, a whole bunch of really talented cartoon voice people who work all the time, whose voices you hear constantly, to talk about their craft. They are joining us from their individual studios. We are we are vocal distancing here. Let me bring in our cast for you. Hi. Welcome, cast. Hi. <laughs> I, I, I'm in box number one. In box number two is Mr. Michael Bell. In box hey. number three. Is Mr. Neil Ross. In box number four is Miss Debbie Derryberry. In box number five, since we need an extra Neil in every panel, here's Mr. <laughs> Neil Kaplan. And in box number six is Nikki Breyer. Hello. Yay! Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm going to ask you each to go through and talk about your careers and uh, what you've done lately or, or shows that are currently airing. We've heard you on. Uh, I always point out to the audience when we're doing this that at any given time, most voice actors are under things called NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, where they're not allowed to announce something that they've done, usually a video game, but sometimes a cartoon show. So they may not be able to tell you everything they're doing right now, and several of them are probably sitting on really big news that they wish they could tell you. How many people here are currently under an NDA and can't talk about some job they've done lately? Okay, there you go. Auditions. Michael, there, there's, there's something, yes. Uh, we're going to start with Michael Bell here. Michael, um, tell these people some of the shows they've heard you on. You've been doing this for a while. and it's, I, By the way, Michael has had a very wonderful uh, on-camera career. In fact, the other day, I happened to catch him on an episode of MASH, where he played a really rotten guy mm -hmm. to the point where Loretta Swit beat him up in one, in one scene. It might be easier <laughs> to ask him what he's not on. Right. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. But it's very rare to, to not see my <laughs> blood. Anything recent. Don't worry about it, Deb. Okay. <laughs> okay. But Mike, Michael, tell us about some of the cartoon shows. I first worked with you on Plastic Man. Yes. Oh, my God. Yeah. That's, that's A cool. personal he, he, favorite. He was yeah. the voice of a plastic man. Plastic anyway. Man, Superman, um, G.I. Joe, Transformers, and Humanoids. Um, I, I lo loved the. Uh, I think there's Smurfs, Rugrats, uh, on Devlin. Peter Green. Pan. What's that? Peter Pan. Oh. Yes, I directed Debbie Berry in uh, Peter Pan. Yeah. Speed buggy. Speed buggy. Speed buggy. Oh, going back. Oh, Devlin. Yeah. Come on. I. Devlin. That was yes. one of my favorites. Oh, the devil! Is, you, you, but you look so young. How could the oh, devil? Oh, stop it! Oh. You're so kind. He has so on the blue light. I would seriously watch <laughs> Devlin before going to religious school. Okay, so. <laughs> well, it's a very Catholic show. So, Michael, you did the voice of uh, Opus the Penguin in the Bloom County special. That's right. I'm working for Steven Spielberg and. Uh, uh, Who? Uh, yeah. Oh, that old that I've kid. And yeah. uh, worked with, uh, not in the same room with, but Robin Williams and Dustin Hoffman. And I got to play Opus. Now, that's that. I'll tell you that story after everybody else gets introduced, because it's one. It's a real VO story that you'll all appreciate. OK, well, we're going to get to that, to that story. Uh, you were, uh, for a while, if I'm not mistaken, Dick Dastardly. Yes, I took over for that, yeah. And also, uh, in the Smurfs, the last season, half of the last season, I took over uh, for Paul Winchell left. He didn't want to continue doing it anymore. So I wound up doing Gargamel along with my other characters. Wow. Okay. Do you remember how Gargamel sounded? Uh, I think he's over here somewhere. Oh, what do we do, Azrael? I did that on the moon. Didn't work. I'm sure there's about 19 other shows we're not we're not we're not remembering here. Uh, tell, tell who you were now. People are going to want to know who were you on GI Joe and on Transformers. GI Joe, I was Duke, and um, uh, Major Blood, and uh, several other characters that were in and out. And Transformers, Prowl, Swoop were the two basic central characters, and Scrapper and several others. Yeah. Okay. Now, Neil, who were you on Transformers and GI Joe? Uh, Transformers, Hook, Slag, Bone Crusher, and Springer, and then uh, Transformers, about six characters. The most popular one would be our old sea salty dog uh, pal, Shipwreck, 
that was probably the one that's the one everybody remembers but i, I did about five others uh, i was the buzzer and monkey wrench and dusty and thunder and Donner <laughs> and my attorneys, Neil. <laughs> I missed that. Neil, go over some other shows you've been on. Well, I, all right, GI Joe Transformers. Uh, I was in Voltron, Defender of the Universe, and uh, in the nineties, I was on uh, Spider Man, the animated series, uh, playing both Norman Osborn and the Green Goblin. Mm. A lot of people reference that. And you did Spiral Zone. Oh well, yes. Well. Uh, yeah, that, that that that's one uh, that we hear about frequently. But um, well, I just want to say thank God for NDAs because, well, I've signed an NDA. Sounds so much better than I'm out of work. So, <laughs> but I no, I do have. You asked what I'm doing currently. A lovely little job, not little, but a lovely job fell out of the sky. At the moment, I'm the announcer and also the voice of the whammy on a game show called Press Your Luck. Oh, and a replacement nice. series, ABC, nine o'clock Sunday nights. Great. And, awesome. And Great. of course, it's hosted by the wonderful Jonathan Banks. And oh, no, oh. no, I mean, Elizabeth. Oh. <laughs> Banks should not be hosting a game two show. completely different show. There's <laughs> the hell out of the contestants. No, it's Wrong answer. Different. Boom. What was I think? I don't know. Uh, I worked with Neil Ross on a bunch of shows. We did a show called Channel Umpty Three together years ago. We he, we had him on Garfield a hundred times. I'm gonna tell a story a little later about Neil on, Gar, on the Garfield show. And we did we worked on uh, OG Readmore. Remember OG Readmore on ABC, the host of the ABC Weekend Specials. Neil did the voice of the puppet live on stage. You're blanking like you don't remember this, Neil. No, no, I'm I'm right with you. I, OG Readmore was one of my favorite characters, and occasionally they would do an episode that he was in, and uh, those are some of my fondest memories. Uh, for some reason, well, I don't know. Maybe you want to finish introducing, and then we'll tell war stories. But no, no, oh, I yeah. remember OG We're Readmore. We're not going anywhere. Well, All right. What else do we have to do today? Let's, 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 yeah. go, let's go to Debbie. Debbie, start naming shows you've been on. Name shows you weren't on first. Name a show you were not on. Um, Rugrats. Okay. Um, All right. Flintstone Simpsons. Okay. Shows I've been on. You guys probably mostly know from Jimmy Neutron. Um, yeah. yeah. And I actually, I started watching them again. They're pretty good. I enjoyed that one. Yeah. Um, if you do say so yourself. If I do say so myself, good show. I have to remind myself that's me. And um, I have to prove to my family that it's me. So I have to like imitate myself. Um, let's see. I did Peter Pan and the Pirates with Michael Bell. He played. Um, uh, which one did you play? No, no I Bell? directed it. You directed it. That's what it was. And I was Tinker Bell's voice. That's right. Tim Curry played Captain Hook. And Jason Marsden, yeah. Yes, that was so fun. And all those little boys grew up and then became grown ups, and they're still doing it. Um, let's see, Bobby's World. That was fun with Howie Mandel. Um, let's look back. Jumanji, um, Adam's Family Cartoon, um, uh, Glitter Force, <laughs> a Monster High, as uh, Trekkilora. Um, currently, I'm doing. Uh, we just finished, it just aired season four of F is for Family, um, where I get to play like seven characters and two grown ups. Woo! Good time. Um, I do a show on uh, Adult Swim called um, Tig Tone. I play the co star, this little purple, uh, purple monster named Helpy. I help. Um, gosh. Uh, Co Crash Bandicoot, oh, Coco Bandicoot, just stuff. I just talk like a baby mostly. Okay, uh, Debbie, we have a, you're getting some help here from the chat room, reminding us of of shows. <laughs> Good, thank you, people. Cases, hope Debbie mentioned Zatch Bell. Oh, <laughs> that's right, Zatch. And then uh, uh, Disney in your oh, yeah. Uh, you can see it behind me on Elephant's Tail. See it on the door back there? Whispers, right. I was the voice of Whispers. And then here's somebody, Dev on the Adventure. Quick question, isn't Deddy Derryberry the voice of the Magic Rainbow from FNAF World? Uh, maybe. 
Loser. <laughs> Five nights at Freddy. You lose. All right. And uh, uh, then, then Verkin had just looked up and said, I just looked up Michael Bell's filmography to his Wikipedia page, and good Lord. Yeah. It goes we'll go on some, longer we'll, than all of ours. We'll go he was in airport. There. <laughs> Seriously, oh, that's right. Oh, yes, that's right. I saw that and I freaked out because I know Michael from television in the seventies, left and right, and of course, you know. But then I saw he was in airport. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. The, yeah. Uncre the uncredited dr bus driver. That's it. That's it. I remembered one more thing. I was in comic book the movie with Mark Hamill. And just for and Billy West. And, and me, I was in that too. And Mark him in here, of course. That's right. Oh, Mark cool. Bunko says, Debbie, I remember hearing you in Tailspin. Another credit you have in common with Michael and Neil. I don't remember. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. We got a few more. Oh, uh, here's a question. Mike, was, was Michael on Canon or Mannix? Both. Twice. Okay. Oh. <laughs> I was under contract to Universal at the time. They, they, when they decided to stop getting attractive guys, they decided to go with actors. Mm. What a concept. You showed them. Wow. Uh, my, you know, it's, it's, we want to fuss a little. Uh, Michael, on the last one of these we did, we had Alan Oppenheimer on. Oh, God, yeah. And we went through a list of, of live action sheet shows he's been on. It's, it's pretty impressive. Uh, oh, Alan? Oh, wow. Oh, I knew Alan when he had hair. <laughs> yes. <laughs> His own. He didn't work as much, much. Uh, 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 one of the, my friends, Maggie Thompson, is online with us too, and she was in Comic Book the movie also. Um, and then here, Trevor Kimball says Michael was in the two-hour premiere of Star Trek: The Next Generation. Mm -hmm. Wow! Everybody's yeah, no, I, no, I, no, I look like Groppler Zorn. <laughs> Let's get uh, Mr. Kaplan in here. Neil, tell us, run down what you've been doing. What, tell us your Transformers and stuff. Um. Well, first of all, it is an honor to finally meet the Neil Ross. Oh, thank okay. you. Okay, because being a Neil and, you know, studying early on with Sue Blue, I heard about the Neil Ross. And, you know, he was one, one of my professional heroes because he's just, he's a utility guy, you know. Oh, and you. Uh, it, is an, it is an honor uh, to finally meet That's you. Uh, it's just so weird to say for me to say Neil. My former agent T.J. Escott once said, "You're my you're my utility guy." You know that, that's yeah. a baseball term. It means you can play any position. You might not be the best at any of them, but you can play every one of them well. And and that kind of was my career. Anyway, I'm sorry, Neil. Go ahead. No, 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 no. Please, I was sitting here fawning over over your abilities because I'm. That's been my career as well. Uh, you know, um, I uh, my bio basically says uh, that I might be best known around the world as the voice of Optimus Prime on Transformers Robots in Disguise. Um, I also transitioned uh, from that to the other side of the uh, good and evil coin where I played Emperor Zarkon on. I've got to look it up. <laughs> Voltron, right? Oh, I've got no, because they were on the other Voltron? Voltron. You guys were on the other yeah. Voltron, so I've got to make sure I don't say the wrong one. Because I was on Legendary Defender. Legendary so, Defender. Yeah. yeah, I was a later generation, so it's a real trip also to be be with you guys. But I worked on Love, Death, and Robots, uh, Robot Chicken. Uh, last year, uh, a, a film that I worked on was nominated for an Oscar called Klaus. Um, worked on the Wacky Races, Pen Zero, Part Time Hero, Benicula, Ask the Story Bots, Higley Town Heroes, and a lot of video games. So, plenty of people out there have killed me plenty of times. Um, currently, they can hear me as Tybalt, the kind of uh, voice from above on Crucible with Amazon. Cool. Wow. So. Not to mention Magneto in Avengers Anime. I'd yet to hear Neil Kaplan's Magneto. Uh, well, that was uh, essentially because it was based on, you know, Ian McKellen. So it's essentially what I did. So I made him just a bit younger and perhaps a bit more aggressive. But essentially, it was my Ian McKellen. Sounds and also a bit more masculine. Oh. And 
Okay. Uh, Michael, two roles I found. Remember Michael Bell from Arzan and Gleek on Super Friends and Bruce Banner on Marvel's Incredible Hulk cartoon. Ah. Now you did. Now, Michael, as I recall, you were doing Bruce Banner and Bob Holt was doing the Hulk. Right. Is that right? Yes. And, and Bob he was had to do all the screaming. He had to do all the screaming and you didn't. And I, I would say, I don't feel good. I, what's up? Uh, Oh, and he go, Bleh! and he <laughs> in the session after we did three or four of those doing one show. And he said, can I ask a question? I said, what's it? Are we getting paid the same money? And I said, I think so. He said, and I have to rip out my lung and you just go, oh, I don't feel good. And I go, Bleh! for a whole show. And he said, you're getting the same money as me. I said, that's not fair. That's not fair. I'm going to lose a lung. You're fine. I'm losing a lung. <laughs> he was very funny. Nikki, Nikki, tell us some of the shows we've heard you on lately. Well, Nikki, uh, Nikki. Oh, wow, <laughs> Debbie, thank you. Um, I miss seeing you guys, by the way, in person. I just want to say that it's this is bittersweet, but okay. But thanks for having me. Um, I have been on Family Guy and American Dad. I've had um, characters on each of those shows. I also do the background voices for them. Um, I think I might be the only full-time Walla person on the panel today. So that's super fun. Um, I was in Lego Marvel Superheroes. Um, I play a lot of kids. So um, there's a lot of, you know, park scenes. And I was in um, um, Call of Duty, which was kind of fun because I don't usually get to do those <laughs> video games sounding the way I sound. So I got to play um, some kids playing on a playground. I played like five, five kids um, and one of them got shot, which was kind of fun. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I have two kids, so it's coming from a place of like... Because they're home with you all the time. Yes, they are home with me all the time. And I think they're even watching in the other room. Um <laughs> Nikki, do your kids, when they watch a cartoon, understand that's mom? Yes. Yeah, so my 12-year-old my son, Beckett, is he tells lots of people that, because um, I do explain to him what I do on Family Guy. So when he says to someone like, oh, my mom's on Family Guy, they think I'm like Mila Kunis or something, which, you know, I'm not. So um, he explains it to them that I'm like the burper and farter. Which, um, you know, as a 12 year old boy, that makes him really, really happy. And it also impresses his friends. Um, but they do. I mean, I show them, I have a 17 year old daughter, Maddie. And so I um, will, uh, she's seen some family guy. Beckett's seen a couple, um, the Star Wars ones he's seen where I had a couple of parts on there. So, yeah, I think they get it. I mean, they're old enough and I've been doing it for long enough that I think they understand it. And I do a lot of, um, I do a lot of toys too for Fisher Price. So that's Ooh, cool. also very fun. Oh my God, that's cool. Yeah. That's You're like a female Paul Freeze. Oh, uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the people in the chat room are busy peeking at IMDb. Uh, uh -huh. Trouble Comics has just looked up Neil Ross's filmography. He played Cyclops and Spider Man in his Amazing Friends. His Cyclops voice was impossibly deep. Any recollection of that, Neil? Yeah, you know, that's so far back. I'm sorry. No, that's Neil, like, I remember that. That was the day those things dropped, and you told me about it. <laughs> how, how low can I said, Michael, go? Michael, I finally have a voice. Yeah, so <laughs> thought, right there. Yeah. And then uh, can't forget that Neil Ross did a great job as Leoric in Visionaries. Oh, thank you. Yes, I have uh, many happy memories of that show. It only went one season, and uh, but it... <laughs> That's where I get got to meet to Roscoe Lee Brown, oh. and, you know, one of the possibly the greatest raconteur who ever lived. Uh, just had to have him tell you a story was uh, beyond wonderful. It was uh, he was a great guy. So I have, I have happy memories of that show. I'm sorry it didn't succeed, but we did our best. Michael uh, Neil, do you remember on we did Channel MD three? Uh, we had uh, Jonathan Harris on the show. Oh, yes. And yes. He told us wonderful stories, except he told them to us every week, the same stories. <laughs> and and at the end of every session, we had, and there were a couple of times when I had to tell Neil during the session that he was accidentally drifting into doing Jonathan's accent and talking <laughs> like yeah. him. It was hard not to get sucked into that <laughs> vortex. And I had the mic next to him. And then next to Jonathan was uh, Alice Ghostly, I believe. Yes. Oh, and, oh talk about it. Sam. And, and when there was a lull, 
which would be Mark in the in the <coughs> control room arguing with the suits, and it would be quiet. And suddenly, uh, Jonathan would go into into this obs these obscene limericks. He seemed to have an endless supply of them. There was a young woman from Kent who went to the pet at the tent, <laughs> and Rob Paulson and I would collapse on the floor, and Alice would just shake her head like, "Oh God, when when am I getting out of here?" <laughs> The, the greatest moment in the, not amused. The, the greatest moment of those sessions was at one point somebody asked. I think we had David Paymer was on that show also. David yeah, yeah. Paymer. And and he had, I think he was the one. Somebody asked Alice, "Is it true that Paul Lynn stole his delivery from you?" She said, "Yeah, well, we did a show together, and after that, he talked a lot like me." But yeah, I guess he kind true. of did. And then Jonathan Harris leans over and he says, "I got mine from Tallulah Bankhead." <laughs> <laughs> Which is true. Yes, that's probably true. Yes. Um, well, he was a, he was a, you know a, a Jewish man from not a very fashionable neighborhood, not wealthy parents or anything. New York, Brooklyn, I believe. Brooklyn. And, yeah, and suddenly. You know, he's talking, uh, I can't really do Jonathan Harris, but suddenly he sounds like this, you know, this sort of thing here. Yeah, and, and people would say, are you British? And he would say, no, I'm just affected. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, yeah, that's funny. He reinvented himself as an actor, you know. Do you know how we cast Alice Ghostly in that show? No. Uh, well, we had cast Jonathan Harris to play um, uh, this Stickly Ricketts. Stickly Ricketts. He was an evil billionaire. And he had a wife who was always sniping at him and saying snotty things to him and knifing him in the back. And we couldn't find the actress for that part. We kept looking at different people and we just we just couldn't find the person. I was at the memorial service for Bob Ridgely, a great Ooh. voice actor mm. that we all loved. And I'm standing in the lobby. There's a long line of everybody in the voiceover business to sign the guest book, the memorial. By the way, that was the funniest memorial in the history of, Mel Brooks was the least funny person who spoke there that, that day. Wow. Uh, yeah, but, uh, it was truly amazing. And Jack yeah. Riley was Jack beyond Ron brilliant. Oh, yeah. Was, yeah. Ronnie, Ronnie <laughs> Shell after his, he got up and told us what he was doing. Yeah, Ronnie Pretty Shell got up and, show. and did his resume for us, yes. He did his uh, resume. <laughs> And this is a memorial. He's wearing a baseball jacket. And yes. he is doing his resume and, and doesn't use the stairs. He just leaps off the stage and, and runs uh, down the aisle and leaves. And Jackson, you'll have to forgive him for his quick exit. He has an appointment at the batting cage. <laughs> so so uh, I'm looking at all the voiceover people. And I'm trying to think. I'm looking at all the women. Like, is any of these people potentially good to play Stickley Ricketts' wife? And just then, a voice actress named Sharon Mack taps me on the shoulder and says, Mark, have you met Alice Ghostly? And I turn around, and there's Alice Ghostly, and I said, you're hired. <laughs> oh, and she man. said, what? I said, "Can you do? are you available to do a cartoon? And she said, I guess I am, yeah. I said, who's your agent? And it was, um, so she was with SBV, I think it was Cynthia. Uh, and I quickly ran over and found Cynthia, because originally was an SBV client, too. So the whole agency was there and jonathan was there in fact jonathan had asked me on the way in if we'd found an actress to play his wife yet and i said to cynthia do you think it'd be tacky to cast somebody at a at bob ridgely's memorial service and she said bob would love it bob would be so thrilled he's, especially he'd want his estate to get 10 percent but he'd <laughs> love it. so literally after the memorial service they got um uh, uh Alice Ghostly and Jonathan to go to the SPV offices, which were within walking distance of my house then. And I went home, got the script, walked up there, recorded them at the agency, sent the tape over to Warner Brothers, got her approved, and she was doing the show the next day. Jeez. It was wow. It was she, owes Sharon, she owes Sharon Mack a couple Starbucks cards. I think she did, it, definitely. But uh, that was a fun show that nobody saw. It was. <laughs> I think yeah. when I got the, we got the Nielsen list, it was just like a list of names of my relatives. <laughs> anyway. Of shows nobody saw, I did What a Mess with Jonathan Harris and, and yeah. Miriam Flynn. Miriam, yeah. Yeah. Where Vic and I did What a Mess with you. Vic and I did uh, Afghani Dogs, two Afghani dogs. We had it was one of those shows where they show the dogs and then the humans are waist down. Right. But we did a whole bunch of those, and I think Jonathan was on a Bobby's World, too. And you're right, Neil. 
it was always that affected voice. It was like mm -hmm. nobody could do it. No. You but say hello to you, Michael. <laughs> I say that Neil. I say that Neil Ross also voiced Benton Quest on Harvey Birdman, Attorney at Law. What was it like emulating one of Don Messick's famous voices? Well, at all. <laughs> I don't. The only time I, I remember being asked to match Don Messick was when they did a parody of uh, Johnny Quest. And that's what they're talking about. That's what he's talking about. Okay. Yeah. Yes. 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 Well, I did my humble best, you know, big shoes to fill, but he wasn't available, and uh, so I did the best that I. I, could. I remember you. You. You had a voice match for Mel Blanc once. Uh, uh, Mar Marvin the Martian. Yes, that <laughs> I uh, I caught hell from. Uh, well, he's gone no. now. I I won't mention who, but another voice actor. This audition came in, and they wanted Marvin the Martian, and it was for some sort of novelty gift, like a cup, and you'd take a drink, and it was oh, you've had a drink, you're drunk. You know, I can't do it. You know, so I read for this thing, and I got it. Five hundred bucks, you know, the voice of a novelty toy, and uh, some other actor who felt he was the definitive uh, Marvin the Martian somehow got wind of this and raised hell with me. How dare you take this job? I am the voice of Marvin the Martian. I said, to them. the drinking cup, five hundred bucks, sue me. <laughs> Calm down. But yeah, I, I did do Marvin the Martian briefly. But I got to okay. say, within uh, the tight voice community that we are, if we have a part and that network wants to recast it for, you know, money's sake, you won't catch any of us reading for that role. No, no. We would that, never do that. I said that to Paul when he was doing Gargamel. I, I called him up and I said, Paul, you're not doing Gargamel anymore. Is this a money thing? Because I won't even consider it. And he said, my son, go do it. He said, he just got $19 million from NBC because they destroyed all my tapes, my original tapes of uh, my show. That, that, was, that was Metro Media, I believe. It was Metro Media. Media. He Whatever said, it was. He said, yeah. Yes. I got the money. I'm not going back. And he said, have a good time. I said, great. Okay. With the blessing. Yeah. With the blessing. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and when Michael did Gargamel, his lips moved. That's a different thing. <laughs> uh, oh. Uh, let me, let me ask each of you now. Uh, I want you to tell us some voice job you did. This probably will not be a cartoon, but something you did that we've heard you in, a commercial, a looping job, a dubbing job, a, uh, uh, a book, an audio book, uh, some unusual place your voice is heard. Now, Neil, you were the voice of a lot of different TV stations doing all their promos over the years. You were the voice of the Game Show Network. You were the voice yes. of the Playboy Channel. Yes. Uh, how many different how many different networks have you been the, the spokesperson for? Uh, that's probably it. Uh, you know, I have done promos for other networks, but I, I was not the voice of that particular network. So it would basically be Game Show Network and, and Playboy. And Playboy was I, I don't know. Uh, the, the, you look at you look at my IMDb credits, and there's a million of these Playboy videos. And I just, I fell into it and I talked to my agent, uh, TJ Escott at the time, and I said, can you think this come back and bite me in the tuchus? And he said, no, it's not porn, it's sort of naughty, and nah, you're fine, you're fine. So I ended up doing a ton of these things, and <clears throat> uh, th th these were videos, and it would be, uh, you know, three girls go in the woods and get naked and they didn't like narration over the nudity so people would say is it is it fun to work on those shows and i say well what happens is i do my lines and then they hit fast forward and these naked women are doing this you know, and like, okay you're back on again and it Nikki, they, remember when we did that episode together yeah it was, still was real. it was delightful yeah, yeah. <laughs> they looked like female naked keystone cops and it, yeah it, sounds it, about right it was not erotic <laughs> So, uh, but yeah. I, Does everybody know about the Playboy art? I think it's art. I, I may have the title wrong. Playboy art of sensual massage is this. There's one. It's a laser disc or a VHS tape they put out, and it's basically naked women and naked men massaging each other for an hour. And the sultry, sexy voice that narrates it is June Ferre. No, <laughs> of course it, it is. It sounds. It sounds like Natasha. Oh my God! That's, narrating this thing. Yes. So now I would have bought it if it sounded like Rocky, but uh, <laughs> yes. No, I I buy it if and well, Tasha was doing. I think it. you and I have different tastes, Neil. Mark, do you remember <laughs> when we did the party for um uh 
Mark's film, the comic book the movie at the Playboy Mansion. I, I wasn't there for that. Oh, I wasn't, I wasn't we got there. to go there and see um, all the big boobed girls and Hugh. And I went in the grotto with SpongeBob and sat there. <laughs> I sat in the grotto with SpongeBob. Oh, I was in the if TMZ I was, finds out about that. Right. The, I, I, was, I, was, I was in the grotto once and saw um, John Belushi having sex with someone, and I have never gotten that image out of my head. So I'm sorry. I never oh, went back. Wow. <laughs> can't unsee. Can't unsee. I hope yes. you all have had your antibiotics after being in the I grotto. I don't know who it was. After this is off, would you tell us who it was? The, 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 the grotto is, uh, it was a, it was a, John and some playmate who I actually knew, kind of. Um, but uh, the grotto's gone. The mansion has been decimated. It's, mm -hmm. it's there's no more grotto. There's no more pools gone. Everything Hef's bed, round bed is gone. Uh, trampoline. Trampolines are gone. The trapezes are no. no they, uh, <laughs> I, I I actually managed to get banned from the mansion one time. A story which does not belong on this this <laughs> podcast. Well, I'll, I'll tell it to people in private some other time. Anyway. Um, uh, but uh, now I forgot what I was going to say. Okay, let's let's go over some of the obscure. Oh, and, and Neil, you haven't mentioned yet your announcing of the Academy Awards and the Emmy Awards over the years. Well, I didn't want to bring it up. No, <laughs> I did. I, you know, I did the Academy Awards once, and it's 17 years ago. It was, if it was a child, I'd have to send it to college at this point. And <laughs> the following year, I did the Primetime Emmy Awards, and then for the next. Uh, few years I didn't do anything and then I was lucky enough to do the AFI Life Achievement Award telecast for about seven or eight years running and that was a lot of fun. It's saw some really interesting backstage stuff. When, when you do something like the Academy Awards or the Emmy, what do they give you in the way of direction of what they want? I mean you have you have 95 different announcer voices. What, what do they? Well I read for the Oscars and to my amazement they chose me uh it, there were two announcers that year uh, and i worked with uh, help me mark suddenly uh, her name is gone uh, uh oh God. yeah she does all of those uh, yeah randy yeah randy thomas thank you yeah, randy thomas, yeah. and randy was wonderful but i mean i you know i had read for it i knew what i did that's what got me the job so i figured that's what they want and so that's what i did the main uh, instruction you get is don't screw up and there are all sorts of ways that you can screw up. But I must say the, the Oscars was a total class act. I mean, because there are a lot of names you got to deal with, especially foreign names. Well, they supply you with or supplied then a cassette with somebody pronouncing all the names and then also a written thing with them spelled out phonetically. I mean, so I would ride around in my car going... Uh, Oh, uh, uh, who who was who was? Oh yeah, uh, uh, Brendan Fraser rhymes with razor. Brendan Fraser <laughs> rhymes with razor, and uh, Catherine Zeta rhymes with cheetah. Jones and you know. Did you, have, didn't you have a problem with Jack Palance that year? No, that, that was not my year. Oh, okay. I was afraid. I did have a problem with Barbara Streisand. Uh, in rehearsal, I guess I was pronouncing it some other way. I don't know what I was doing. But anyway, we took a break and we were on the way to lunch and we're walking along and suddenly this tiny little woman runs up and grabs my arm in this vice-like grip and hisses at me. She said, listen to me, it's Streisand, Streisand, Streisand. And I said, uh, okay. And she, she disappeared. I never saw her again. I have no idea who the hell she was. But from then on, it was Streisand. It wasn't me. Uh, no, yeah. no, I, you I would have remembered. And yeah, you couldn't have screwed up more than Warren Beatty. You couldn't have screwed up more than Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway. You oh. couldn't have done anything as bad as that. Oh. In his defense, it wasn't his fault. I know. That's true. Well, there was a, a couple of years later, I think it was the Primetime Emmy Awards, the, the announcer uh, did mispronounce an actress's name, and she proceeded to walk out and say, it's Gladys Ormfby. Yeah, I vey. What a what a nightmare for this poor woman. Michael, tell us something you voiceover you did. Tell us about the voiceover that that put you on the map. Uh, that would be uh, Parquet Butter. Butter Parquet. Uh, <gasps> really? I didn't had know that. You didn't. You Mantequilla. Must. Mantequilla. I did it in Spanish. I did. It I in know. 
I did it in Italian <laughs> and I did it as an opera singer. And uh, and it, and I call my house Los Residuales because of uh, parquet. Los Residuales. <laughs> I didn't know you did parquet. Oh my oh, God. No. There's the voice of that Butter. guy. Okay. Butter. Okay. Uh, uh, Michael, there, there's a rumor that you took a lot of the money you got from that and used it for animal rights activism. Well, you know that, kiddo. I, I, I helped you with your feral cats. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I'm pushing that poor man. I, I said, are they spay? Are they neutered? You're, you're taking care of them. Uh, you're getting them spayed? Get them spayed. Get them. Don't you tell me you're not spaying and neutering them. You can't just fit. I made his life miserable. Yeah. No, no, you actually helped it out a lot. And because of you, there is a feral cat in my backyard at this very moment who's been there for 19 years. Oh, boy. Wow. God. Which, is, which in the city is an awful long time for a, a cat. Do people, know, do people know what Michael Bell has done for the animal community and his daughter, Ashley? I mean, this man is a saint for animals. He And he always has the answers, too, if you don't know, you know, which um, person to vote for who's going to do the best for the animals. Michael is like this wealth of information. And I, I can't tell you the number of times he's helped me out on my rescues. You're sweet. Did you see uh, Love and Bananas, Ashley's film? Oh, yeah, I was there at the premiere. Oh, that's right. My God, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. she's amazing. She's just, it's just so it's lovely. Just, uh, it's just taken over now in South America. It's traveled all over the world. Now it's just new in South America, and she raised... She raised a half a million dollars for rescue of elephants in Asia. So what far. a film! Yeah, it's a gorgeous film. But yeah, that you know, that's uh, uh, the animal thing. Obviously, uh, all that money coming in now from residuals, which let's hope we continue to get, guys, in the new contract. Uh, that money goes to uh, for not just animals; it also goes for uh, seniors and kids. Would you like to say a few words, Michael, about the new contract? Well, I'm not going to get into it other than the fact that anybody who's a performer in our union, anybody who's watching this who's in the Screen Actors Guild, vote no on that deal because it's going to decrease our residuals. It's going to make it difficult to make residuals as a result of the way they have set it up. Send the negotiators back to the to the table and say, we want enough money so that actors have something we can really look forward to and they can live with and live on because this contract isn't going to do it. Are you talking the animation one, not the theatrical? Animation. This don't people do animation? Don't forget, yes, when but theatrical is generally the imprint for what's going to happen next. Animation's coming up. Your contract is coming up next, so you want to see what's going to happen with theatrical. It's like we want to see what happened with the Writers Guild. We want to see what happens with the Directors Guild, because it imprints upon us. It becomes a patent. It becomes something a pattern, I should say. We want to make sure that that pattern is similar for us. So if they get a great pattern in WGA and a great pattern going along in, in directors, we want to make sure we get the same damn thing. And this one is caca, you know, so it's that simple. So vote okay. no. Vote no, everybody. But let's move on. Debbie, uh, where else have we heard you not in cartoons? Um, can I tell you three things? Sure. Okay. One of them which came back to, I don't know, bless me, 22 years later was uh, the looping session on Toy Story 1 where um, we had to go do the gumball full of the little aliens going, pick me, pick me, oh, the claw. It was just a few seconds that we went up and did that cue, but everybody remembered it and it was just crazy. And then I did the Pizza Planet lady in the background going, you know, Waltman party is six, your pizza's ready. And they called me 22 years later to come voice that voice for the ride at wow. Wow. Yeah, looping coordinators to keep notes. Wow. Okay, second weird thing I've done is, um, do you remember in Disney World, there's the carousel of progress where you go in because you're hot and you want to sit in the air conditioning and me and um, um, what's her name, um, Gordon Hunt's? Uh, PJ Ward. Yeah, me and her did the voices for that. I was a girl from infant I mean, from little toddler to teenage in that carousel of progress. Cool. Um, and I forgot I did it. And then I was there with my son one year and we were in there and he said, that's you, mommy. And I'm like, oh, well, for God's sakes, it is. <laughs> it was a long time. And cool. then the third weird thing is that movie Free Willy um, with the little boy. I was the body stunt double who rode the whale for the boy. Although, if you asked me to do the job today, I would say no, because I don't believe in animals and mammals in captivity. 
so I wouldn't do it again. But at the time, it was a pretty great job to be in the waters for seven weeks with that whale and ride him and drown. Wow. wow. Great. Wow. Uh, going back for a second here, we have an uh, endorsement of Michael's uh, position on the union contract from Greg Berger, who's out there watching us. What Michael said. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hi, Gre Hello, Greg. Greg was on, Greg. on channel. Greg, I just saw a picture of Greg 30 that years ago. Where Was that that picture you showed me, Mark? Um, I don't know. Where? Actually, you know what I may have shown you? Hey, let's, I'm going to show you that, folks. We'll, we'll get back to everybody here. I'm going to show you a photo here. And I've got some. Oh, no, it was the one he posted on Facebook of him doing that weird thing, that guy. Well, here, here, I'm going to show you an interesting picture here. This is the photo of a Garfield rap party when we're oh, doing the Garfield of Friends show. Great. There's yeah. Greg Berger on, on the left. He was about nine years old when we took this. <laughs> the gentleman right behind him is Tom Hughie, who was the voice of John on that show. Tom is retired, retired from the voice business. The next to Tom Hughie is Julie Payne who was John's uh, girlfriend, Liz, on the show. Below Julie Payne is June Ferre mm -hmm. in the, the colorful dress there. Uh, mm -hmm. Next to, well, we'll get to Howie in a second. And next to Julie Payne is Frank Welker with the mustache. Right. Back there. This is Frank apparently doing his Clark Gable impression. Uh, and then Howie Morris in the, in the salt and pepper suit there. Howie Morris, one of my favorite human beings in this world, one of the great voice actors. We miss Howie so much. Some of you, if you may know him from uh, uh, playing Ernest T. Bass on the Andy Griffith Show, but he was a cartoon voice guy. He was um, Adam Ant, and he was Jughead on the Archie Show, and he was Wade Duck on the Garfield shows, and it, a lot of things. Susan Silo is next to Howie. Chuck McCann is towering over two mm. women. Uh, Tress McNeil is next one over. Then there's Gary Owens with the mustache in the back in front of Neil Ross, who's there. Woo! I'm not that short. I was ducking so Gary <laughs> wouldn't be blocked. Seriously. Uh -huh. and, I'm much, and, much taller than that. And everyone and looks thinner. short next, next to Mr. Stan Freeberg, who's yeah. standing over there on the right. And the front row is Jim Davis, creator of Garfield. Me and the man with a cup is Mr. Lorenzo Music. That's right. Hiding, hiding much of his face as he always did. <laughs> anyway, that's, uh, and, and at that session, we had two other voice people at that party. Uh, Greg Burson and Paul Winchell were there and we don't, when the same time take the photo, they just kind of disappeared on us. Anyway. That's um, so cool. They're so cool. Okay. Neil, where, uh, Kaplan, where else have we heard you? What else have we heard you on? Uh, I, I do uh, audiobooks every now and then. I did, I was the narrator of the YA series. I am number four. Um, I did a voice uh, that people can hear at Oswald's. If they go into California Adventure, when it does open back up, mm. you know, just inside the gate to the left. Um, and uh, Debbie Derryberry and I were the voice of Care Bears. Right. The same, the same generation of talking toys. The 2020 talking toy cheer bear, Care Bear things. Ages ago. But I think they had... <laughs> I think who who else was in there? Cam Clark was in that group and uh, Wally Wingert. So they had uh, Jimmy Neutron and Optimus Prime and He-Man as the voices of Care Bears. Care Bears. That's, that's cool. like an awesome crossover. Yeah. yeah, that's neat. Nikki, where else have we heard you? Lately? Um, let's or any see. place? Well, something something we didn't know was you. Let's see. Um. Well, I did this really fun, I don't know that anyone saw it, but I did this really fun, um, there was a movie called Universal Remote. It was done by this man named Gary Hardwick, who um, was sort of oh, ahead Gary, of his time. with the horses. Yes, Gary's great. And so the whole idea of Universal Remote, it, it was about these guys who... Um, click a remote, a magic remote, and then they're they're popped into whatever show they're watching. Adam Sandler also did a movie very much like that a couple years later. One of the one of the shows that they popped into was this show, this animated show called That Darn Jesus. And um, it was about Jesus and James and what a jokester Jesus was and Joseph and Mary and um I played Jesus as a 13 year old boy, which was super fun. Um, as a 40 year old Jewish woman, it was super fun. Um, 
And then um, this guy, I had, um, this is the toy that I did for Fisher Price. I've done quite a few, but um, I got to send this to, well, one of them to um, my nephew, who's just a year now. But when he was born, I, um, I was able to send it. And so my brother and sister-in-law, it's, it's irritating. It's a kid's toy. And so they turn it off and they're like, okay, we're going to put Aunt Nikki to sleep now. And so <laughs> I know, I know. Cool. Yeah. Or they're going to turn me off or put me to sleep. It's something like that. But so it's referred to as Aunt Nikki. I have an oh, right. like to have done that too. Yeah. I, <laughs> I, I had a couple. I would have liked to have done that too. So I wound up doing their voices instead. <laughs> I was getting back. Okay, let me tell. I'm going to tell a quick story here, if I can. Um, I want to talk a little bit. Something we haven't discussed in these panels before: uh, behavior at sessions, uh, being ethical, being professional, being you know, behaving the way you want to. There are so many people, good people in the business these days, that there isn't much room for the person who misbehaves. Uh, some people have destroyed their careers by not being very professional. Uh, several years ago. We were doing the Garfield and Friends show. There was a voice actor whose name I will not divulge here. Who I ran into this guy at Farmers Market one day. I live near Farmers Market, and he said, "When are you going to get me on the Gar on the on, on, on Garfield and Friends again?" And I said, "Okay, listen, we're recording next Tuesday. Uh, I'm, I'm booking you right now." And I do this sometimes because I like to write to people. I thought this guy has a lot of great voices. I will create a character that's perfect for him, and that will be the villain of the story and whatever it was. So I wrote an episode with him in mind. I had them all booked. So he was booked for the afternoon session, and Neil Ross was booked for the the uh, morning session do, uh, doing something. So Neil finished the cartoon he was in, and he was just ready to leave. And I just suddenly get a phone call uh, at the recording studio from the agency. Uh, it was ICM that represented this actor I had booked for the afternoon. And a secretary... Not an agent, a secretary there says, oh, uh, I just want to tell you that he woke up with the flu. He won't be in today. Goodbye. Oh, boy. And Ooh. I thought to myself, wait a minute. Ooh. First of all, it's like 1130 in the morning. How do you wake up with the flu at 1130 in the morning? <laughs> Secondly, I have a paying job here. Doesn't the agency say, could we get you another actor? Can we send you one of our other clients? You've got a you've got a paying job. You've got a re responsibility to fill. Could we book somebody else? They didn't even do that. Wow. So I was kind of annoyed by this, and I suddenly thought, Hey, Neil could play the part. And I ran out, and Neil was getting in his car in the parking lot. And I said, Come on back and do another cartoon for us. So Neil came back, and he did the, the, the mm. played the part, and he played it wonderfully. It was fine. Mm. That mm. afternoon, uh, Frank Welker was in the session. And uh, as he comes in, I mentioned, I happened to mention the name of the actor who had allegedly had the flu. And Frank said, oh, I just saw him in an audition. I just came from where, where he's it's for a big national commercial. It's callbacks. Oh, and I thought, God. oh, this guy decided he would rather go to the callback for the big national commercial than to do my scale paying job. And I, I get angry very rarely. <laughs> Uh, but I got annoyed at that because, first of all, if the guy had called me and he had my home number, he could have called me and said, hey, can you work around this? And I would have accommodated him. We always are doing favors for each other and rescheduling and stuff like that. And secondly, you didn't have to lie and stick me like that. What if, what if I didn't have another actor I could have plugged into that? Um, anyway, so I, I, have never, I never hired that actor again, as you might understand. Now, a couple weeks later, we're doing another session. And I had Neil booked, and he was booked for the afternoon also. And I get a call at 9 a.m. I get into the studio at 9 a.m. Neil's call time is like 2 o'clock. And there's a message waiting for me from Paul Doherty, who was Neil's agent. Call him immediately. Neil, we have a problem with Neil. I called up, and he said, Neil woke up this morning. His throat's a little scratchy. He's worried he can't give you the performance you want. Uh, and is there a way that I could book somebody else for you? Uh, if, if, if you need Neil, he'll be there, but he's just worried he just can't, you know, give you what you need, and which is very considerate of him, very professional, to, to, and to tell me immediately, tell me at the earliest thing. And I said, uh, that's fine. And, and Paul said, um, tell me who you want to have there. Even if they're from another agency, I'll get them there. So I told him two names. I said, if you can get me either one of these two clients of yours, I'll be fine. 
and he brought sent me my first choice client who was Michael Bell. <laughs> and Michael Bell ended up doing that job that day. And okay. Neil called me later to apologize and make sure I was okay. And I thought, that is professionalism. That's and one up. of the reasons mm -hmm. that Neil's been on every show I've directed ever since then is that he is so reliable. And, and, and not only is he so versatile that he can do anything we throw at him, but he is professional. I think once or twice on sessions, I've had a problem in the recording session. And I suddenly had to say to Neil, Neil, listen, I'm sorry. Could you go wait in the waiting room for half an hour? I've got to do these other things first because of things I have was having on channel MP3. I had the network yelling at me all the time and I never made a problem, a problem for me ever. He was always on time. He took direction fine. He was creative. He came up with ideas, but he didn't force them on me. And sometimes I just, I just have an enormous admiration for Neil as a, uh, as a, as a director, this is an endorsement of him. Oh, and you, I wanted to, That's I wanted to tell tremendous. people if there's anybody out there who wants to, get into voiceovers. Uh, Neil has a website. Uh, it's, I'll show you the address again later, but it's www.neilross.com. And he has his demos on there. If you want to get into voiceover, go to his website, listen to those demos, and say to the words to yourself, this is my competition. Hmm. They're the best demos I've ever heard an actor have. There's a lot of good ones around. Nice. But those are just wow. an example of them. Nice. And you I'm understand. You will understand why he gets called so often that people who work he works for hire him again and again and again. I was doing a job for the World of Warcraft people. I was down in Irvine working with them, and they showed me a, they showed me an animated sequence from a new video game they were doing. And this character comes on the screen, and I went, "Oh, that's Neil Ross," and they they were so impressed. That I recognized his voice. <laughs> <laughs> they said, "Wow!" And he, he, they, they, when, they, when the executives came, they said, "He recognized our voice actor. He knows the voice actors." And I said, "Yes, that was Neil Roth." They said, "Yeah, Neil is one of our go-to guys. He's he's terrific. We we love him." So anyway, um, uh, does anybody have a story about? And you don't. And please don't mention names. <clears throat> anybody, I do about non-professional conduct in a session. I oh, do. Oh yeah. <laughs> N so this time Debbie and I were in the studio. Oh, I'm just kidding. Um, no, I actually this. Uh, I was just telling this story the other day. I um I had I was just starting out. Um, I had um gosh, it was probably 2000. It doesn't matter. I had I was just starting out. I had booked my first pilot. I was super excited. Um, it was back in the day when like. They had a PA, you know, bring your script to your house. And it was just, it was exciting. And I spent, you know, I was up with my husband and I was, you know, looking at all, all my lines and read the script. I had to have read it, you know, three or four times and highlighting everything and making notes. And um, I get to the studio a couple days later and, and it's, it, ca the, the people in the cast were people that I had looked up to like forever. I mean, like Tom Kenny and Maurice LaMarche and Tress McNeil. And we were, we were um, recording as an ensemble. And so I'm, you know, I'm sitting in between Maurice LaMarche and Tom Kenny and I'm giggling cause I'm so excited. And this is my first big thing and there's an empty chair. And so we're, you know, clearly waiting for somebody. And then that person we were waiting for rolls in maybe 15 minutes late sunglasses on and they had no idea what this was or what we were recording and it was somebody who had been in the business for a long time who i had up until that moment looked up to and i sort of looked around like is this normal and everyone worth any salt was so shocked that this person a held us up held the producers up um, had no idea what this job was because apparently they had so many jobs that they just couldn't like keep all their stuff straight. And it was, and I remember at, right afterward calling one of my best friends who's also a voice actor in the business and I was telling him about it. And he, apparently that was a thing. This person did quite a bit. And um, they're still working and still book a lot of stuff, but I was... It was a real eye-opening experience to be so new in the business and 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 I still all these years later 
whenever I get a script, I'm super excited and, and I, you know, mark it up and I, and I'm on time if it, early really, cause early's on time. And it just was, it was surprising to me that, that there were no consequences and that it was just this sort of like, yeah, that's what they do. And so that was, that's, this was years and years ago, but that it stuck with me. It, it really was disheartening. I can think of about six people that could have been, but uh, Neil, well, you I'll tell story? you later who it was. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Kaplan, you have a story. Um, I, I have, I have, I have a couple. Um, one was uh, a show that I worked on that I was really loving. And uh, uh, one day I got a call from the producer and they were releasing me. Um, and it was, they went down a list of reasons why, and I kind of thought to myself, that's not true, because actually I've made mental notes to make sure I'm not doing that. And then the actor who came in and replaced me is one of my favorite people, and I kind of un- kind of got the, the, the subtextual message that that's the person they wanted all along. And uh, they were not available initially. So um, mm. it happens, you know. Um, I learned a lot on that show, and I'm grateful for the experience. Uh, but uh, just a reminder not to ever count your chickens before they're hatched or tell anybody that you're working on something because you might not make the final cut. <laughs> Two word for you, Captain Planet. I was about to say that, Neil. <laughs> We can you come I, to that. You, no, you, yeah. you were replaced by Tom Cruise, weren't you? I was the original Captain Planet. Right. So they did, got I think we did two shows together, right. maybe. Right. Yeah. And then I get the call from the agent. You're not going to believe this. They've, they've hired Tom Cruise to do it. That was it. deep, yeah, wasn't it? It's ridiculous. This was way before the celebrities really started to get into and, voice. And they got Ricky Goldberg to replace Annette Netty. And they got James Coburn to replace me. Wow. So it's happened to better men than I. So, <laughs> well, it, 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 you got to understand Captain Planet. It was like auditions, callbacks, winnowing it, winnowing it, winnowing it. Now yeah. it's down to three guys come back again. And finally, I get the thing. And we're going to do a million episodes and everything's great. And then now they're putting Tom Cruise in. And my agent said, it's not going to work. He's not going to do this. You'll get it back. Trust me. So about a month went by. Cruz was just about to take off into superstardom at this point. He was just just inches away from that. And I think during this period he did, and they realized he didn't have time to do it. I don't know why he dropped out. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> my agent called me and he said, oh, you got it back. I told you you'd get it back. And I go in and I ADR two more episodes. And then the agent calls and he says, well... You know, while everything, all this nonsense was happening, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles came out, and it's a big hit, and they've decided Captain Planet should be a teenager. Uh. So you, you lost it again, and they gave it to David Coburn, and he, he did the rest, and the rest is history. But, yeah, I mean, that's one of the more painful ones, Neil, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I know the feeling. And uh, I just wanted to piggyback on what Mark said. I don't... You know, if I had to give advice to a young up and coming talent, one of the first things I would say to them would be try to be the lowest maintenance actor on the set. Mm-hmm. Uh, when, when, because, you know, when someone like Mark is going to cast something, he's got two actors of equal uh, ability. One of them's on time and doesn't make problems. The other one, oh, I'm this, I'm that, my car's not working. Wh- who's he going to hire? Right. Unless he's out of his mind. I did have one story, and I won't say who, but I was in a show, and one of the cast members was consistently late. And I'm not talking 10 minutes, I'm talking like an hour, an hour and a half. And it, it got to be a joke. We'd all sit in the green room and look at each other and eat the bagels, and the producer would go, well, I suppose he's uh, uh, not gonna show up again. All right, well, I guess we should go in and start rehearsing, I don't know. And this went on for 13 episodes. I finally confronted the guy in the parking lot and I said, what's going on? And he said, well, I'm getting hot in promos, you know, and they don't give you a lot of notice. I'm just about to leave the house and they call and they say, we need six promos and I'm not gonna turn that money down. And I thought, okay, fine. Now here's the capper. The show ends, 
uh, six months later, the producer is mounting a new show. I walk into the audition. Who's sitting there? The actor who was late all the time. He called it in for the next show. I thought, well, hell, you deserve it then. You know. Right. You know, right. I, now, right. Yeah. We, we just had we have we have, we have here a uh, a note from Greg Berger. I was in a play and an actor arrived 20 minutes late. The director stopped rehearsal and made the person apologize to everyone in the cast and crew. He cost them each 20 minutes. Point was made. I apologize, though. <laughs> <laughs> now, Man, Mark, I wish they had made that person apologize. It would have uh, that would have been really the icing on the cake for me. We had a session once where a very reliable actor arrived an hour and a half late. And I was as angry as I get. But I thought, I, th I was actually, I called his agent and said, is he dead? Is he, you know, do you have an accident or whatever? And I go, no, we don't know where he is. Anyway, it turned out what happened was another, he had a morning session and the director of that session was not anywhere near through with the show by the time our actor had to leave to come to my session. So he told the actor, oh, I called Evanier and said, I told him, can we keep you a little while longer? He said, it's fine. The director lied to him oh, and told no. him uh, that I had given him permission to come an hour and a half late, which I had oh, not done. No. And at that moment, the, when I told the actor, you know, no, I did not make that call. You know, I, he lied to you. He said, could you excuse me for one minute? And he went in to the next room and I heard him screaming at the at the director and quitting the show i'll never work for you or your damn studio again and then he came in and apologized to everyone and was totally professional after that wow. and never late never late any place else uh for that we had that so it's not always the actor's fault uh but now, uh, now mark yeah. i did have one other story because you know you do have some younger um actors who watch this some voice actors and this was very informative to me I worked on a show, we were recording scenes, myself and another actor, and when I say actor, I mean that in the generic sense. <laughs> um, well, no, I don't want it to, it's not about a man or a woman, oh, it was my okay. partner in the scene. I thought you were like actor. No, 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 okay. no, I'm just, I'm taking <laughs> the gender out of it. Gotcha. Um, and while I'm, we're doing scenes, I'm reading dialogue, this person is futzing with their clothing and turning pages, and making noise. And I was really taken aback. I was like, do you understand? There are microphones here. They're recording what we're doing. I went out during a break when they were recording the other actor and I ran into the casting director in the lobby and the casting director asked me, how's it going? I said, do you know this other person? Because their booth etiquette's horrible. And the casting director said, I didn't want to use that person. I suggested somebody else, but they loved the audition so much. And I came back to another session later, that actor had been replaced. And I asked the casting director, who I'm kind of friendly with, will you let the actor know why they lost the job? Will you, will you tell them? Will you let their agent know? And the casting director said, no. Oh, that's I don't, too bad. I don't, I don't have the time. And... Frankly, I didn't want to use them in the first place, and they're not worth my energy. And I just sat there and went, ugh. But I also, it was a lesson for me why somebody might go with an actor or actress that they know mm -hmm. over an aud a brilliant audition that they love the sound on the tape, but they don't know this person. Yeah. You know? And it became sh shockingly clear. You know, one of the reasons why, as Neil was saying, be low maintenance, be easy to work with, mm -hmm. because especially now with so many actors um, in this game, if they're not already invested in you, they're not going to take the time to give you notes or, or tell you what you've done wrong. You know, yeah. ind indicative, indicative of that in, in terms of disappointments that get turned around, you mentioned earlier, Mark, um, Bloomberg, the, the uh, uh, Wish for Wings that work. The, the role of Opus, Bloom County. Yeah, yeah. We got we got we got word that they're going to audition everybody in town for Opus except Frank Welker and Michael Bell, because they didn't want two recognizable voices who work all the time. So I figured that was that shot was gone, and they went with some young fella. And then after a short period of time, got a call back, and they said um, 
they decided to go with Frank Welker because they didn't like the other guy. So Frank wound up doing it. And then I got a call to come in. Frank had finished doing it. And I got a call to come in because Spielberg played the voices for his son, who was quite young at the time, and said, here's some of the voices and mine was in there from the audition because they gave me the audition. I think it was Danny, rest his soul, Goldman, who brought me in. And uh, they said, okay. And he said, which one do you like? He said, that's the voice of Opus, which was me. So I had to go in and climb into Frank's underwear, lit <laughs> his pace. But I had to do my voice, my character approach, but Frank's pace, because Frank has a different pace in terms of playing the character. But I wound up getting it, it became, it became a classic. But the idea up front that they didn't want Frank Welker or Michael Bell, because Danny called me, he said, we, we, I'm trying to get you or Frank out here to do this, and uh, they're not interested. They just really want to get some fresh sound. They got their fresh sound, that didn't work. They went to Frank, and, and it just, his son, Spielberg's son said, that doesn't sound right to me. And so you just, you know, you, you never know the way that thing gets tossed around. You just don't have a clue. You, have you ever I, noticed the, the kiss of death when an audition comes in and it says, um, Yes. Audition for this references Debbie Derry Berry. Um, you yeah. know, your name is the reference. Oh, I know when Debbie Derry Berry is the when Debbie Derry Berry is the reference. I know I have no shot. I I, I, well, that's, I don't either. If that makes you feel any better. Neither does Debbie. Yeah, <laughs> we want we want some of the sounds like Michael Bell, but we don't want Michael Bell because I've heard that dozens of times yeah. years ago. I mean, not now, but years ago when I was doing this a lot, it was so funny. And the agent once said. Well, I got Michael Bell. Peter said, I, I got Michael Bell. He said, no, we're thinking someone like Michael Bell. He said, why would you just hire Michael Bell? Right, right. Like Michael he, I'll bet he could be like Michael Bell. <laughs> so I said to Rob Paulson, you go out for that, you're dead. <laughs> we once time, I was, I was casting a show, and they said, um, we don't want Frank Welker because he's on too many shows. He's heard all the time. And, and there was also a concern that he wouldn't be available. That he was booked so much that we suddenly needed to record on a Tuesday. He was, he Frank was for at times very hard to book. Yeah, and, that, and that's yeah. possibly and that's possibly a legitimate reason not to hire someone. But this was one of those shows where they cast by the numbers. The people who made the decision did not know what the, they heard all these voices and all these reads on the tape, but they didn't know which voice was which. And uh, we got through, and, and I auditioned Frank anyway. And they came in and said, uh, uh, that voice number nine is Frank Welker. We recognized him. We don't want him. We want voice number 14. And I said, that's Frank Welker, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There was a, sh it was a show at Ruby Spears I did one time. It was an ABC Weekend special where they had uh, two roles. It was, a, a dog. It, was, it was the original version of Benicula. And they had a dog and a cat. The dog was supposed to be gruff and mean and a little slow and and you know deep a deep low voice and the cat was supposed to be high strung and crazy and uh and the auditions they, they did again blind auditions and they finally picked voice number 32 for the dog and voice number 16 for the cat and then they okay. found that they were both don messick <laughs> and they said, well, one guy can't do both of these parts, so they didn't hire Messick for either one. Oh, please. They, they wound up with Jack Carter as the dog oh. and, and Howie Morris as the cat, little realizing that there were no two human beings in all of show business who hated each other more than Jack no. Carter and Howie <laughs> Morris hated each other. And the session was, was you know, a line at a time that was... Oh, I love, it. <laughs> I love it. It was frightening. Yeah. I so it. I had anyway. something. I have something funny. Uh, it involves someone on this panel. So I had booked this job. You talk about not wanting to be high maintenance and you want to, you know, yes and everything, right? And so I had booked this job, and it was it was it was a great job. And I, you know, we it was this big. Um, we were uh, ensemble recording in this studio, and and um, I was super excited. It was an ongoing job that it was going to work for a really long time, and and as the session went on, we were doing little like fifteen minute snippet things. And as the session went on, I just kept saying, "Oh my, they're going to replace me!" Like because they just kept throwing things at me. When I auditioned, I specifically I don't. I don't do accents super great. And so I generally don't gravitate toward auditioning for things with accents. And so 
the thing I had auditioned for didn't have an accent, but halfway through these sessions, they wanted a slight accent. And I just kept thinking, you're going to do it. Just do it. Just, and I was like, can you give me a minute? And I stepped out and I did it. And I thought it sounded okay. And I came in and it sounded horrible. And the whole time I'm just preparing myself like, okay, they're, they're going to replace me and it'll suck for a minute, but it'll be okay. And so my friend was a, was a punch up writer on the show. And so when all of these little things came out, she called me and she was like, so it's been released and you sound really great, but you don't sound like you. And so I watched it and it was called Monster High and the character was Draculaura and it was Debbie. It was not me. <laughs> so, but I knew I was going to be replaced. And so like the one time that I actually accepted it, it was okay. And I had run into Debbie, I think like at our temple or something. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. No, that's, no, no. I, we remember we like ran into, into each other at temple or something. And you're like, I just booked this great job. It's called monster high. And I was like, Oh my God, where are, who are you? And you're like, I'm Draculaura. And I was like, oh God. yeah, I was that I'm one time. <laughs> Do you remember? Oh, I think we yes, were like I sitting at like remember. a women's theater or something in the middle of our temple. And you were like, yes. oh, my God, I'm so sorry. And I was like, no, no. And it was one of those moments that I was like, it was not going to happen. Like, I knew it in the session. It was like a crazy four-hour session or something with these amazingly talented people. And I'm just going, this is no bueno. This is not going to work out well for me. And then... It didn't, but I'm glad it worked out for someone that I like and that I know. And so, but yeah. Darn. No, 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 no. Okay, now I feel really. Do no, not no. feel. And, and, I told and, you even and, then not to feel bad. Do not it, feel bad. I'm way over De it. Right Debbie, now. in this business, eventually everybody will replace everybody else at least once. Right. I, I and it, it, all, it all balances out. You know? and, 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 and you've been and you've been in sessions where two actors have been cast and they swap roles in the session. All that happens oh, all yeah. the time too. It, ha it happened with me and Mel Blank. Oh, well, we're going to, you know, lose out to someone. Losing what, what, out to Mel is not so bad. But, but Michael, tell that story. Well, I I was brought in on something. Joni Gerber, rest her soul, brought me in to meet with Mel Blank and Noel Blank, and they were doing something. She said, "I want you to Michael Bell. He does voices," and, said, and I wasn't doing much at the time. I was basically an on-camera actor. And he said, oh, okay, come on, bro, come on in here, boy, chick. Let's, let's do something together. And, and Noel was directing. And he said, yeah, we're going to do this for a commercial. Let's see if it works. And he said, wow, sure. And Mel had to be an East Indian rug seller. And I was a guy buying the East Indian rugs. And, I was, and he said, so and he did his thing. And I said, sir, how much it'll be? And how much will that cost, et cetera? And I'd like this. And it, it went back and forth. It was kind of jokey. And then Noel said, dad, uh, East Indian. You're just doing Indian. Do East Indian. And Mel did his and he said, No, no, Dad, you're you have to be East Indian. And he said, Isn't that East Indian? He said, No, Dad, that's American Indian. He's Michael, do you do East Indian? And I said, Yeah, I do. I, I do do that. But and I looked at Mel and I said, Is is that okay? He, he said, Go, boy chick, go. So I did the East Indian. Mel played the other role. And they bought the commercial, and it was a radio commercial. And I went home and I said, I just beat Mel Blank out of a role. Wow. Mel Blank. I, I'd be Mel Blank. I, I couldn't believe Mel Blank. He didn't do He does everything. He sang. He was a wonderful actor. He, did, he just didn't do that particular character, that particular, uh, that sound. Nikki, yeah. it just, just one of the things that he just never there's worked. There's just some things you can't do, and it's well, okay. There's, <laughs> there's a reason. There's there's re he probably wasn't asked to do it before. There's a right. reason those Warner Brothers cartoons also sometimes had Stan Freeberg or Arthur Q. Bryan or or uh, Dawes Butler in them. Mel had a fantastic range, but sometimes you want a different voice playing off somebody else. Cool. Anyway, let's show these people what you guys do. Would you grab your scripts? Yes. Uh, we're going to do a reading now here of the same script. Everybody's been reading at these. Um, now, I will assign the roles. This script is a is the script of th uh, three little bears. This is a very boring script intentionally. <laughs> Anything funny you hear in this script was put there by the actors with their reads. I'm going to assign the roles. This is what's called a really cold reading, and uh, we weren't to allowed to look at the script. By the no, way, that's right. Yes. Okay. And they didn't even know what part they're going to play. Neil Ross, you are going to be the narrator. Oh, of course. And and, and Neil, I would like you to read each narrator line as a different kind of announcer narrator. You have enough different voices to fill that out. 
you, are you hearing me, Neil Ross? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, I'm good. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, Debbie, you are Goldilocks. <laughs> Nikki, you are the mother, and you are also Mama Bear. Okay. Neil, you are Papa Bear. Michael Bell, you are Baby Bear. Now I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes um, to. Uh, when yeah. when you said Neil is Papa Bear, Neil did Kaplan you mean Neil, is, Neil or Kaplan is Papa Bear? Kaplan, Papa Bear. Sorry. Thank Not you for, 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 for <laughs> I knew you, got, you have to double check these problem. things. Yes. Uh, listen, I once had a session. I once directed a session where I had Greg Berg, Greg Berger, and Greg Burson in the same. <laughs> oh my gosh! And I also had Walker Edmiston and Frank Welker in a session. So I had Walker and Welker, and and sometimes you just get so screwed up this way. Now, while you folks are marking your sessions, I'm going to leave you alone for a moment here, and I'm going to talk to the people out there. Um, I'm not going to do my little speech that I do throughout these, because if you've watched this panel, you've seen the other ones. I have this little crusade I have to, to stop people from going and giving their money to bad, predatory voice coaches, of which there are a number in the business. Some people are just... Um, not very honest and not very good. There are some wonderful voice coaches out there. That's all I'm going to say this time. Double check, triple check. Don't give a lot of money to somebody if you don't know who they are. Uh, we've got a bunch of questions in the chat room here about upcoming voice panels. So while they're marking, I'll tell you a few things. Um, uh, Georgie wants to know, could you do a panel with Kari Payton and Kari Walgren because it would be funny since they have the, sin, the, sin, the same name. No, we're not going to do that ever again. But uh, the panel after next, Kari Walgren will be on it. Um, the next voice panel that will be on the air is Saturday, July 25th. And it's a connection with the Comic-Con in San Diego. I already recorded that panel uh, because they want those pre-recorded. And that will be moving on uh and we put on the comic-con website and also on my site shortly after on july 25th and that's a panel we did with misty lee lorraine newman bill farmer and d uh, bradley baker and we actually did a different script on that panel because i only had four people on it it's, it's only an hour but it's it's quite a wonderful panel we, we will be back with another one, two weeks after that, on August 8th, we'll be doing a, a live mm -hmm. panel in this same venue. And uh, I have confirmed three people so far for it, Kari and also Maurice LaMarche and John Bailey. And the other two I have to confirm. And uh, that answers several questions we have here of who's going to be up in the next voice panels. Uh, Devin asked me, uh, are you getting Kat Cressida, Christopher Corey Smith, and Chris J. Alex for the next voice panel? Uh, no, I haven't asked any of them yet. I don't know those people. The people I've been, I have been booking and putting into these panels here are mostly people I've worked with because I can just call them at home and I have it's easy to get to them. And and there's and there's some wonderful people. So uh, I don't know those folks. And if they ever want to do a panel and they get in touch with me, I'll be thrilled to try to work them into something. Um, how you come and cast with the scripts? So good. Uh, are you anywhere? Okay. I'm all uh, Mark. When do we get to plug my voiceover classes? We will pl plug everything. I'm at the choking this. about this. Yes. <laughs> well, we're gonna we're gonna plug a very good book about uh, voiceover. I wonder what here. that could be. Yes. Anyway, we'll talk about that. Um, uh, and uh, doo -doo -doo. Uh, let me see other the questions here. When, when it looks like I'm not paying attention to these people, I'm either looking at the chat room or doing tech, <laughs> tech stuff here because I'm directing this at the same time I'm trying to ask questions here. Uh, okay, oh, also, while we're reading the read, don't ask any questions because they'll just scroll off. We're not going to interrupt the, the read for questions. Save all your questions and comments until after we do the read, and then we're going to do high-intensity uh, uh, rapid fire questions two things from the chat room here uh so <clears throat> all right cast are you uh, anywhere near ready yeah if you're not if you're not we'll start Born now remember ready. you can change voices and you can change lines anytime you want you can change voices anytime you want uh do whatever you want with the characters i'm not giving you any direction other than uh, neil's instruction to give a different kind of read to every announcer line, every narrator line. All right, we will start with um, Neil Ross is going to start us off on the story of Goldilocks and the Three Bears. 
Once upon a time, there was a little girl named Goldilocks. She was called that because she had golden locks of hair and she was very beautiful. Hello? Hi, my name's Goldilocks. I'm called that because I got golden locks of hair and I'm very beautiful. <laughs> One day she told her mother she was going to take a walk in the woods, and her mother gave her a warning. Oh, mother of mine, I'm gonna go take a walk in the woods. Do not go into the North Woods, my dear. There are wild animals in the North Woods, and they like to eat little girls, especially little girls with golden locks of hair. Oh, please don't worry, Mother dear. I'll not stray into the North Woods. But the trouble with Goldilocks was that she never listened to her mother. It often got her into trouble. On a walk, she came across a sign. <laughs> What's that sign say? Warning, now entering North Woods. Oh, little girls beware. <laughs> I'm sure they won't bother me. She continued merrily on her way on a path that would take her right past a big wooden house. In that house, there lived three bears. A papa bear. Hey, Mama. When's lunch going to be ready? I'm starving. And there was also a mama bear. Oh, I'm serving it right now, Papa. Sit down at the table and I'll give you a big steaming bowl of my delicious porridge. Porridge again? I thought you loved my porridge. I eat your porridge. <laughs> That doesn't mean I love your porridge. And lastly, there was their son, who was known as Baby Bear, because rather a no-brainer, he was a baby bear, you see, actually. Goody, let me have it. Mama does make the most delicious porridge. Give me some of that, mother. You see, Papa, someone here appreciates my cooking. It looks hot, but I can't wait. My porridge is way too hot. Let me try it. Oh, ha, 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 ha. My porridge is way too hot. <laughs> By the time this porridge cools down enough to eat, we shall starve to death. Papa Bear's right. Oh my God, you guys are killing me. Nonsense, <laughs> my child. I know what we'll do. We'll go for a walk in the woods. By the time we get back, the porridge will be perfect. And so that's just what they did. They went for a walk in the woods. And being very trusting bears, they didn't even think to lock the front, front door. I don't know if that's a typo or they want to. Front. That, that's a typo that, that no nobody has read, has read before in this. As opposed oh. to the side front door. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I, oh, I, don't know why we, I don't know why we have to. Oh, sorry. I should decide on what I'm doing here. <laughs> I don't know why we have to always eat porridge. How about some real food once in a while, don't you know? Um, but you love my porridge. I love porridge, Mama. See? Quiet, son. Let me tell you what real food is, Mama. How dare you? A few minutes later, who should wander past their house but Goldilocks? Oh, I guess I made a wrong turn. I should go that way. Oh, wait. Maybe this way? Or shoot. That way? I don't know. Oh, shit. Oh, shoot. I'm lost in the forest. I'm hopelessly totally lost and no one will ever find me. Oh, wait. Oh, no. I know who will find me. A bear will find me and eat me and kill me up. Maybe the people in this house will help me. She ran to the front door and knocked, but no one answered. In fact, the door slowly opened on its own. Uh, thank you, squeaky door. Hello? Anybody there? Here? Anybody? Come on, is anyone here? I'm lost in the forest. I haven't had anything to eat. I'm hungry. I'm tired. And... Wait, what's that? It, it smells like, um, uh, 
uh, McDonald's. Oh, porridge. Porridge. It smells like porridge. Her nose led her to the dining room where she found the three bowls left there by the three bears. Gosh, I hope the people who own this house don't mind if I, you know, eat a little. Mm. Ow, ow, this porridge is too hot. Shoot, wait, okay, maybe this bowl. Oh, this, uh, this porridge is too cold. Okay, maybe the third bowl. Mmm, yes. This porridge is just right. I, I'll just eat a little. <laughs> she gobbled down every last bit of porridge. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> and then she staggered into the living room and sat down in Papa Bear's chair. <laughs> Ouch! Shoot, this chair is too hard on my butt. So she tried sitting in Mama Bear's chair. Oh, no, that hurts my sciatica. This chair is too soft. Finally, she tried sitting in Baby Bear's chair. Oh, yeah, yeah. This chair is just right. <coughs> oh, no. I broke that cute little chair. Oh, well. Anyway, I need some place to lie down. She staggered into the bedroom where she found three beds. She decided to lay down on the biggest bed, which was Papa Bear's bed. Oh, no, this bed is too hard. No, that won't do. So she switched to the next largest bed, which was Mama Bear's bed. Mm, oh, no, no, this bed is too soft. Oh. And finally... She lay down on the smallest bed, which was Baby Bear's bed. Oh, yes. This bed is just right. <laughs> and as she was fast asleep, the three bears were returning home. Ugh, why do we even have to have porridge for lunch, Mama? We've always had porridge for lunch, Papa. I love porridge. <laughs> well, that's because it's all you've ever eaten, son. <laughs> uh, wait till you're older and you get a taste <laughs> of some of the finer things in life. <laughs> Papa, did you lock the door when we left? You know, we never lock the door, Mama. Uh, why do you ask now? Because it's open. It's wide open, like someone walked right in while we were away. And what if some dastardly criminal who wants to steal our porridge? Hey, he's welcome to mine. How <laughs> dare you? What, what if it's a monster? <laughs> a monster 20 feet tall and covered with green fur with rows and rows of razor sharp teeth. Oh. No! No! Yeah. What if it's the kind that can tear a bear limb from limb and leave his body lifeless on the ground like an old rug in front of a fireplace? An old bear rug! Well, he's still welcome to my porridge. You know what? I have a great idea. Why don't you lead the way into the house, Papa? But take it real slow and be real... Big target. I mean, careful. Be careful. <laughs> Cautiously, they entered their house. An ominous feeling of dread hung low in the atmosphere as they made their way to the dining room. That was where they saw it. <gasps> Someone's been eating my porridge. Someone's been eating my porridge? Someone's been eating my porridge and whoever it is is eating it all up! No, well, at least someone liked it. <gasps> Papa! Look over there! The living room! Your rocking chair is rocking all by itself! And the seat is still warm. Someone's been sitting in my chair. Someone's been sitting in my chair! Someone's been sitting in my chair and it smells Funny. And they broke it to pieces. What's in our house? Is it a ghost? Is it a monster? Is it a demon spirit? We lost both of you, 
lose. Your light and your imaginations get the best of you. An empty bowl of porridge and a broken chair don't mean shit. I'm sorry, it don't mean there's a monster in the fucking house. What's that noise? What me out of here? Stop! In the name of love. But do I have to have all the courage in this family? Are you going to be terrible role models for me, you young and impressive noble son? If there's a monster here, we have to find it, face it, and vote it out of office. <laughs> <laughs> My son is right. This is a moment that requires courage. <laughs> um, that ghastly sound was coming from the bedroom. Follow me! Slowly, cautiously, they tiptoed into the bedroom where they found... Oi, someone's been sleeping in my bed. Someone's been sleeping in my bed. Someone's been sleeping in my bed. And she's naked. And she's sleeping here right now. I, I hear somebody. I, I need to get dressed. <laughs> Goldilocks screamed, ran from the bear's house, and threw the woods back to her home. She never disobeyed her mother, and she never went into the woods again. As for the three bears, from then on they kept their doors locked. Oh, and Mama Bear learned how to cook something besides porridge, AM and FM. <laughs> So, um, for dinner tonight, I think I'm going to make porridge. Just Finally. kidding, roast chicken. <laughs> Finally. Stuffed with porridge. Oi. Hey, that's, <clears throat> that's, uh, <clears throat> that's, uh, that's good eating. Well, wow, something just dropped, Mom. Oh, baby bear. Pretty. Bravo, bravo. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. That was a hoot. That was fun. Yeah. <laughs> that was fun. All right. Um, a question that I haven't put to you yet in this, folks, is I'd like you to each name drop. Tell me someone you worked with in a session you were really impressed you worked with. Somebody you went home and told people, you would never believe who I worked with today. I worked with who? who somebody. Um, I... Uh, Starts off sad, gets better. Uh, <laughs> my mother passed away when I was 19. And, uh, you know, I'd think of her, it would make me sad. And then one day I had a session. And it was a commercial session. And it was with Dick Godier. And I walked in, and there was Broadway's original Conrad Birdie. There was, there was Jaime from Get Smart. There was Robin Hood from, from When Things Were Rotten. And I thought for a second, oh, my God, I've got to call my mom. Oh. And that was the first time that I thought that, and it felt good. Because, like, for that moment, for that instant, she was with me as much as any other time when she was alive that she wasn't in the room. And I told that story once when I was at a convention to Billy Boyd, and I made the unfortunate resolution of saying, and so now whenever I think of Dick, I smile. <laughs> Same. Oh, Same. God. Just like you, Debbie. So, <laughs> so Neil, Neil not only gives us our obligatory Dick Godier anecdote for this panel, but our, also our double entendre at the same yeah, time. Thank you, Neil. Levels. New levels. Very, very good. Debbie, you got something you were impressed to work with? Well, in addition to getting to work with Michael Bell, <laughs> that was pretty awesome. Oh, let's um, have, before I forget, everybody. Uh, I saw, I told Michael this before we started here, I caught him the other day on an episode of MASH, a rerun of MASH. The episode is called Souvenirs. Every MASH episode runs on some cable channel every week. Look for Souvenirs. You will see Michael Bell with a very large part playing 
a real slimy, awful person, so awful that Loretta Swit beats him up in the in this episode. It was it was quite wonder uh, quite a wonderful performance. Anyway, I'm sorry, Debbie, go ahead. So we were doing Adam's Family once. First of all, I I got to work with a ton of famous people over the years because you know producers love DACAs. That that's my anacronym. Is I darn on camera actors. Mm. Oh, that's DACAs. <laughs> anyway, love, love me, me uh, working with famous people that I recognize, which is, it, it makes me kind of starstruck still. But we were doing Adam's Family at what, um, Hanna-Barbera, and somebody said, Jonathan Winters is down the hall. And we were like, what's he doing here? And they said, he's sitting at Gordon's desk. And so um, we all ran down to see uh, Jonathan Winters and say hi to him. And I don't know what he said. He went on for a really long time and made people laugh. And um, I still can't tell you what, what exactly he said because it was so crazy, but it was just really funny. And um, yeah, uh, that's my Jonathan Winter story. But to get to see him and he, I don't know, he was on. He was doing something really, have you guys? He was him? always on. He was, yeah. Michael, Michael, you worked with him on the Smurfs. Yeah, we did the Smurfs, and he he played Grandpa Smurf. He was brought in later, and uh, he he was there was so much conversation going on. It was hard to get into a session because he was always playing and doing shtick. And uh, at one point, uh, as Grandpa Smurf, he did a voice, and we finished. And the next week, we came back, and he started the voice. And and Gordon Hunt, the late Gordon Hunt, rest his soul, said, uh, "Jonathan, that's that's not the voice. It's a different voice." And Jonathan went, "Okay." Is this the voice over here? And he said, no, Jonathan, that's not even. <laughs> what about over here? Is that the voice over here? He said, no, Jonathan, that's it. He said, what about, is, it, is this one over here? He said, no, John, that's it. I said, John, you're suffering from voice hymers. Will you play it back for him? <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan <laughs> used to, when the Smurf sessions broke up, I had, a, when I was working at Hanna-Barbera, I had a great office. I don't know why they gave me such a good office. I was only in there like two, three days a week. And there would usually be writers in there talking with me, plotting against management. And Jonathan would always come into my office because he knew he'd find an audience there. And he'd walk in and he'd, he'd just walk in and I would say to him, aren't you that Civil War general or something, whatever? I give him his character and Boom. he would just lapse into it and do <laughs> half an hour. Uh, and he would somehow always, every single time, he would get it around someplace the story to his personal hatred of Bob Hope, which somehow <laughs> he, would, he would start, he, 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 one time he was this this uh, uh, holdout Japanese soldier from World War II who'd been on the island for years and years and years, and he explained how he was was trying, he was standing, poised with his gun, ready, and he had dreams of, of waiting for Bob Hope to come back and shoot his plane down. He said, I just see it, all those cue cards fluttering to the ground. <laughs> <laughs> was, he was quite, quite a wonderful quite a guy. Quite a yeah, uh, it, yeah can switch characters and go on and amazing to watch and he'd yeah. tell you he's crazy he would tell you I'm, I'm i'm crazy he would tell you he was crazy yeah jonathan was on the garfield show a couple of times because i have this obsession with booking everybody i could get who was in the movie it's a mad 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 world which oh, is my favorite movie Cooper. and of course so we had on the show we had don knotts we had marvin kaplan we had uh um uh buddy hackett we had lenny weinrib we had uh arnold stang we had jesse white anybody i could get who was in it's a mad 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 world was on was on the garfield show at, at some point one of the one of the garfield shows we did and uh jonathan was just jonathan and he at the end of the day, we had to like ask him to leave at some point there because we were trying to record another cartoon. Go home. Uh, yeah, uh, Neil, you got somebody you worked with you were real impressed to work with. Yeah, Rob? a couple of couple of stories come to mind. I I worked for Robert Redford in his uh, movie Quiz Show. I did almost all the voiceovers in that picture. Has everybody seen Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid? Sure. Yeah. Okay, well then you'll get this. He called me back. And he said, I test run the uh, test ran the movie in San Diego and uh, I made some notes and I want this one line you do even bigger. I said, oh, OK, bigger, fine. Rack it, roll it. Boom. Take one. Uh, you know what? Even bigger than that. Bigger than that. OK, fine. Rolling. Take two. I jump in and I realize 
one syllable in, I'm way too over the top, but I just keep going. It's up to him to decide if it works or not and uh, cut. And I said, I think that was maybe a little too much. He said, oh yeah, that was way over the top, way over the top. You sounded like you were at the bottom of a cliff screaming for help. And I said, well, at least I didn't yell shit on the way down. <laughs> <laughs> and he actually, I'm sure he endlessly got kidded about that scene and he sort of smiled a little. His sound guy broke up quite nicely though. And the other one was working for uh, Warren Beatty in, uh, in uh, Dick Tracy and um, that my one and only on camera job. I'm visible in the film for about a second and a half, I think. But that was. I gotta that watch it. Again. I gotta watch it again. I love the film. I gotta watch it again just to see yeah. you. Well, don't blink. <laughs> I, <trust me. laughs> I, I have uh, another star studded um, okay. thing. I mean, for me, I um, I love Family Guy. I've never got to be on Family Guy. I love Seth. I've been. So his concerts and hearing him croon, I just, I think he's a great performer. And um, so somehow or other, I booked a looping gig on A Million Ways to Die in the West. <laughs> and it was one of those where they bring a couple people in and you do the screaming lady, you do the screaming lady, you do the screaming lady, and you never know who they're gonna pick. And so, and then right before us, there was a whole bunch of little people um, doing something else and their job was over really quick but I got to do screaming num lady number one in the photo booth and Seth directed me and so like for I don't know I say a good 12 seconds he spoke to me and directed me and it it was so exciting he tells <laughs> that story does he I knew he would it, he probably remembers it, That's it right? I, I I've heard it several heard. times Debbie he, he's tell always this. telling that story Just to jump in uh, when I was in the contract universal Obviously, they, we did a lot of TV shows, and I wound up uh, working with Lana Turner, uh, who came over and introduced herself to me. And of course, I had seen her when I was a kid, sitting in the theater, and I'm watching this gorgeous creature on in these films. And of course, she's much older now in, uh, in this particular Survivors. And she comes over and she introduces herself to me. She says, hi, I'm Lana Turner. Who are you? And I said, uh, I'm, I'm Michael Bell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> talking to her. And she said, do I have any scenes with you? And I said, I, I don't think so. She said, well, I'll see you later. Oh. And she walked away and then the, the makeup guy went, whoa, <laughs> you're next. Whoa, Lana. <laughs> 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 guys, guys, that's Lana Turner. I don't want to hear that about Lana Turner. That's Lana Turner. I was a kid, I grew up with Lana Turner. And then a couple of months later, I'm casting something and I'm working with Jack Palance who is so creepy and so interesting. And he and said down the same the line, thing. All these people <laughs> from films. And finally I get a film called Blue with Ricardo Montalban. And he and I are quietly back at the, at the office that you know, we're on location and it's not a scene for him. It's not a scene for me. And he says, Michael, do you know how to play pool? And I said, no, I'm you know I'm Brooklyn boy. I should be, but I I don't. I was you know stickball maybe, but no police. Come on, we are going to go into town, and I'm going to play pool with you. I'm going to teach you. And I said, Wow, okay, great. Carlo Montalban's going to teach me how to play pool. So we get in the car and we're driving to town, and I'm sitting there. I'm, I'm yeah, it's Ricardo Montalban. He goes, You know, when you are on location, it gets very lonely. And sometimes you reach out to people. He turns and looks at me and he goes, you know, you have the bluest eyes. Uh-oh. <laughs> and I going, in the meantime, I can feel everything important shriveling up. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is big, massive guy saying that's been famous movie star. And I went, oh, yeah, you know, I guess. And he went, gotcha. <laughs> amazing yeah that's amazing and, uh, and 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 then the last is louis hayward i don't know if you remember who louis hayward was mark who was a very well-known actor in, in yeah film. yeah i'm doing the survivors and louis hayward and i working together he's he's going to be killed by me i'm going to kill him on the bad guy and i have a newspaper and i'm sitting in this in this uh hotel and he walks by so off camera i turned to him i said i have to tell you you gave the most extraordinary performance uh, I mean, sort of a, uh, it was one of those uh, period films where you played a fop, but you were really the count. You were the, you played this Count Sirocco. 
and you were very ha 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 ha, your majesty with Billy Barnes, but secretly you were this, this, the, the great guy. You'd get on the mask, the thing, and you'd swashbuckle and you'd kill everybody and you were fabulous. You were the hero, like, uh, uh, was it the Scarlet Pimpernel? But I said, you did this, ha 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 ha, your majesty. You played this real um, quality character, very highfalutin, and it was the first Betty Davis impression I'd ever seen in the film. Where he roared, he said, "How old are you?" And I said, "My 30s." He said, "And you remember that film?" I said, "Yeah." So now we're filming, and he crosses the path. He starts across the the, the studio, and I'm sitting there, and I got the newspaper, and I fold the newspaper down, and the audience sees it's me, and I watch him, and he goes off camera, and just as he gets off camera, he goes, "Oh," <laughs> and I had to hold it. Because I was a studio player and I couldn't lose. I was afraid, you know, I couldn't just break up and say, okay, let's do it again. I had to hold it and I'm just watching him like this. And I've literally got my thighs clenched and my hands clenched because I want to laugh so hard. And he's going, <laughs> and when I got home, I said to Joni, who I was going with at the time, Joni Gripper, I said, guess what? I met Louis Hayward. She said, Mikey, you didn't. Louis Hayward. I said, yes. And he went, ha, 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 me. <laughs> Enjoy my life. Great. Uh, folks in the chat room, we got about 10 more minutes. Can I tell my uh, celebrity story? Oh, sure. Let me, let me just get them those. If you got a, any questions, especially ones I've missed in the past, send them, ask them now or forever hold your peace. Nikki, go ahead. Okay. So I was really lucky to be in this very strange show called Glenn Martin DDS. There were two series, two uh, seasons. It was on Nick at Night. And it was um, this claymation show about a dentist who um, traveled around the country in his RV and the, and the wackiness that ensued. And it was uh, Kevin Nealon, Catherine O'Hara, Judy Greer. And then there were always a bunch of, you know, celebrity guests. And so I was doing Walla on the show and the casting director who knew I do did kids voices uh, wanted me to play uh, a boy on the show and so um, I got to go to the table read, which was super fun. And so it's, you know, everybody's there and and it's, you know, famous person, famous person. And then they were like, OK, Nikki, we need you to sit here. So I sit down and, and I'm in between Catherine O'Hara and Bradley Whitford, who was um, guest starring on the show. And so, you know, we had our scripts and we, we run through it and we get to my part. And, you know, when I met him, I was like, hi, I'm Nikki Breyer. Nice to meet you. And he was like, Bradley Whitford. Nice to meet you. And I was like, I know who you are. And then we we do the script and it gets to my part. And I'm playing this kid named Daniel. And I have to sing Amazing Grace as like a 12 year old boy. And so I do it. And like right after I finish, he turns to me and he goes, I did not see that voice coming out of that face. And I was like, well, thank you very much. So then at the, <laughs> at the recording session, we all recorded, um, we recorded that as an ensemble always. And, um, you know, people like Jimmy Kimmel was in that episode. It was like a two part episode and Bradley Whitford was in, uh, in that episode. And so we're sitting in like, we're, we're at a break and we're like sitting in between and Catherine O'Hara sits down and I'm like, you know, I've wanted to be a funny woman my whole life and so she was like an idol of mine and I'm sitting with her and and you know we were never there they were never there when we were doing Walla so being there with them and so she sits down and she goes little boy right and I was like yeah she's like how many times do you do that on the phone to get out of telemarketing calls and I was like oh my god all the time and I do I mean I now my phone says that it's spam and I don't have to worry about it but it just to be complimented by Catherine O'Hara, I was like, you, I could, I could die now and be perfectly happy. And then Bradley Whitford was, was quite funny because this was, I guess, his first voiceover job. And so he was asking me all these questions about mic technique. And I was just like, uh, you know, uh, ask Kevin Nealon. I, you know, I'm not going to give you any kind of advice. So that was, that was exciting. That That's was my big. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Don't die now, Nikki. Don't do. Don't die. No, I don't want to die now. That was so many years ago, and I lived through it. So I'm. I'm good. Yeah. People are people. People are going through Michael Bell's IMDb page here. Michael was on a Three's Company. Yeah. Michael. Michael was on the Monkees. So, yes. Let's see. We got some questions here. Do the actors prefer to do home studio auditions in studio, or does it depend on the project? 
Corona. <laughs> yeah. In the yes. studio. It depends in on home. the pandemic. In the home. Yes. Yeah. No choice now. Yeah. It's, it's super fun to be in with everybody, but like there is no choice. Yeah. We like to be. You get you get fed that way from the other actors. Absolutely. Uh, Nicole yeah. Portnov wants. I want to hear the two Green Goblins talking to each other. <laughs> Neil was one Green. Who was the other Green Goblin? Neil or or, or the other Neil or? Uh, I, 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 I did I mean, it on it a video a game. <laughs> well, that counts. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, what have you got? Bring it on. Let me see. I believe I did something a bit. Closer to, no, that wasn't it. I did. <laughs> I, I fall into the Joker. I fall into Mark Hamill's Joker way too easily. Oh, Same. Um, which, which, bring, which, brings us, which brings us to the question: Do the actors keep notes on what they did in the voice audition, or do they rely on playback of the audition recording? Oh, I like that idea. Playback. 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 We yeah, audition you... for so much every day, all day, that. It, uh, to keep notes would I I don't I can't I save it all in my Dropbox yeah and I can find the audition when I'm when I'm at the callback I can call it up on my Dropbox usually the engineer has it but if they don't they'll play it for you yeah have it with you yeah if they if they got okay. any brains at all they've got reference tapes they can play for you at one point I got so busy I did have a cassette with all my characters on it and I would carry a little cassette player around yeah. in the car and just before I went in yeah. the studio. I'd... <laughs> Come on, okay. And I would go. Actually, uh, Neil, I did a video game once and they didn't have the reference. Mm. And they said, This is the description of the character. What do you think you would have done? And I said, <laughs> I'd have done two different two different oh. takes for you. I'd have done a hundred and sixty-five pound take, something a bit thinner and weedier. Mm. And then I would have given you somebody larger, you know, like two sixty. And they said, Great, today you're doing one sixty-five, you're coming back next week to do two sixty. So it was like so that one time it worked out yeah. as an advantage. I, I, gotta, I gotta credit Michael. It's his concept. I know we're running short on time, but he's, he came up with the best description of what we do. Because civilians will ask me, I'm sure you get this too, how many voices do you do? And I always say, I hope the hell I never find out. But they seem to think, you know, you have 23 voices and you go in and go, well, I think for this one, I'll use number 17. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. But Michael says what we're doing is playing vocal Mr. Potato Head. Yep. I don't know if you want to take it from there, Michael, and expand I teach on Japanese students. I teach Japanese students. I've been teaching for the past 10 years. They fly in from Osaka and uh, areas of Japan. They're, they're, uh, they're kids from uh, college. And the first thing I teach them is I said, do you, you know what Mr. Potato Head is? And they said, yeah, they all know Mr. Potato Head. I said, well, that's what you do. I said, change the eyes, change the nose, change the mouth, whatever it is. It's still you. It's still that central character. If you listen to Mel Blanc, you can hear Mel Blanc, but mm -hmm. he's so good that he changes vocal things, but it's still basically the Mel Blanc sound. No matter what the character is, it's just he, he is Mr. Potato Head. He changes all these different things, although yeah. that's still him in there. That's still us in there. And I explained that to the kids I, when I was teaching years ago. Uh, Neil, years ago, I had my theater and I was teaching uh, voiceover. And I explained, you are Mr. Potato that, That's what you do. But you, you know, who can remember? Who can remember doing, the, you know, you have some stuff, yeah, that's your basics, but then you go from there. You're learning every day. Yeah. I uh, broke it down in my, I have this voiceover book I wrote, and um, I, I made up this game that's in the book that's sort of like Mr. Potato Head. It's like charades where you, you, you know, you grab a piece of paper. Okay, you're ancient, and you're from the South, and you have braces, right. and... You know, and you put all these things together and see what comes out for for technical use. It doesn't mean that you ha don't have to be an awesome actor as well. Right. That's Debbie, is, Debbie, is this book still in print available? Why, yes. Thank you for asking. Here it is. <laughs> Voice over <laughs> <101. laughs> actor. You can get it on my website or at Amazon. Thank speaking you of your speaking oh. of your of your website, there Debbie, we can find you at uh, Twitter. We can find you on TikTok. We can find you on Instagram. And I think dub, just www.debbyderryberry.com will take you to your website, if I'm not That's mistaken. That's it. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. That's good. Thank you very much. Good. This is this is all good. Nikki, let's talk about where people can reach you. Would this not be where they can reach you on Twitter, on Facebook, and on Instagram? Um, and, uh, and my website is www.nikkibriar.com. That's a very good place for you to be. Yes, very I good. Think so. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
Mr. Kaplan, wait a minute, let me get you on the screen here. There we go. Hey, hey we Nikki, are. Nikki, you don't got to do the www. Yeah, you anymore. don't? No. no oh. It's really okay now, dear. <laughs> All right, so NikkiBriar.com. There you go. Nikki, I'd still say www. You go on, girl. How about HTTP colon slash? Don't forget the S. Oh, oh. S. Oh, uh, yeah. right. All right. All right, that, these are where you can this where you can find Neil, okay, and then um, uh, Mr. Bell. Yes, is, is his website michaelbellvoices.com. Right. If you, go there, uh, if you go to YouTube and you type in on YouTube Michael Bell Voice Animation Seminar, it's free. Um, I recorded oh, nice. an hour uh, the de how to develop and create characters, and I did it with uh, some young people that were in the Groundlings, oh, and. Wow. Uh, I them come up one by one and even though they were good in improv and nice little actors they really weren't sure how to create characters vocally so it's an hour of that and you're more than welcome to to tune into that on youtube again michael bell voice voice animation seminar very good sir now neil ross is oh. at um uh here we go here www.neilross.com <laughs> is where you can <laughs> neil you can put the book oh. down you can put the book down neil i've got it here <laughs> Oh, I got it here. So fancy. Oh. Well, I just wanted to show how thick it is. Where are we up here? <laughs> so okay. Wow. You know, it's, it's longer than War and Peace. So that even if you don't read the good. damn thing, it's a, it's, a it's a doorstop. Or when winter <laughs> rolls around, uh, you'll never be short of kindling. And uh, yeah, www.neilbook.com. And it's uh, everything you wanted to know about voiceovers and we're afraid to ask. It's a very good book. We recommend how you get, and it's, 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 uh, I have it. I, I read it in the galleys and, and thought it was wonderful. And, uh, is that uh, when you were rowing? That's right. Yes. I was rowing in the galleys and, 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 and row. And, and it, and it floats, Neil. I found out it floats. Very good. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. And if you, if you know where I want to see me someplace, I'm at www.newsfromme.com. That's my blog I've been doing for almost 20 years. It's got more messages on it than you can ever read. But I occasionally talk about voice people. And it's where I announce uh, the uh, upcoming seminars and things I'm doing online. Uh, like next Tuesday, uh, I'm doing a one-on-one -on -one in conversation with my friend Jeff Altman, one of the best comedians in the business. And uh, on Thursday, we've got the whole crew that does the comic book grew online together and a bunch of all sorts of fun other things and things like that. Anyway, uh, I am very pleased at this panel, how this came out. You folks are terrific. Um, I thank you all for being here. I thank everybody for watching. This whole show will repeat on YouTube almost immediately. If you missed the beginning of it, as some of you probably did, you can watch the parts you missed. You can tell other people about it. Um, and it will be there for as long as until they until I take it down, I guess. I have no plans to take it down. Um, anybody anybody have parting words they want to say to anybody? Anything we haven't got? Debbie? Do you have access to see how many people came to see us today? Uh, I can, yeah. It's been fluctuating around, uh, between 70 and 100 for a while, which probably translates to about 300 people that came and went. Uh, cool. And uh, if you look at the counter in about 24 hours, it'll probably be around 700 people will have uh, a, lot, a lot of people don't watch live anymore uh they miss the fun of being in the chat room because people are not used remember the days when you, if you wanted to see a show that was on at eight o'clock you had to be in front of your tv at eight o'clock yes. oh yes. Yes. yes we have several generations that never had that problem so yeah. the show starts whenever you click on it so <laughs> that's how it works but uh we're very happy with this we will see you at upcoming voice seminars and i hope one of these days i see you in person right. and do oh, one of I these so. on a stage with an audience that we can hear yeah. and uh we, we, thank you mark but, well you know i said that when we did the first one of these i i said uh, please applaud these people but save some of your applause because these days all the applause ought to go to medical personnel we're back to that again and yeah. uh, uh i'll say something Wear a mask. Wear your it mask. Yeah, wear it down. Time, it'll work for you too. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. Yes. Yes. We. Yes. We. We can. Uh, the people who are interested in voice stuff like this, um, we love. We treasure you, folks, and we'd like you to stay alive. So please wear a mask. Yes. Everybody, wave goodbye. We're signing off now. Bye, Thank guys. You all. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye.